we're going to talk about chapter 37, um, nursing care of the child with an infectious or communicable disorder. So infection uh, refers to the invasion of body tissue by microorganisms with the potential to cause illness or disease. Immune systems are still developing with kiddos, so their natural curiosity um, in infants and toddlers can definitely lead to a wide range of handling different objects, touching different surfaces, and then they have a tendency to place their, their hands and those objects into their mouth. Um, newborns display a decreased inflammatory response that contributes to an increase for risk in, in infection. Cellular immunity is generally functional at birth. Humoral immunity occurs when the body encounters and develops immunity to a new disease. Because infants have limited exposure to diseases, and they lose that passive immunity from mom after birth, this does put them at higher risk for infection. So some of the types of infectious diseases that we're going to talk about are bacterial infections, um, which might include sepsis, um, viral infections, which will include viral exanthem and rabies, Zoonotic, infect, or sorry, zoonotic infections, vector-borne infections, parasitic and helminth, helminthic infections, which might include roundworms um, or head lice, and then sexually transmitted infections, including gonorrhea or chlamydia. So in, with infections, we have seen a dramatic decrease in incidence and severity of infectious and communicable diseases um, due to vaccines, antibiotics, antiviral drugs, and antitoxins. Prevention is really the big key. Um, so we really need to educate our families, our parents, our caregivers, um, making sure that they're doing good hand washing, that they're adequately immunizing um, children, that they're properly handling and prepare, preparing food, and that if they are prescribed antibiotics, that they're judiciously using those until the antibiotics are complete. So according to the infectious process, an organism enters the body, it multiplies, and then it causes damage to the tissues and the surrounding cells. So what happens is the body then um, recognizes that it, that it has a problem, so it delivers fluid, blood, and nutrients to that area to try to eliminate any pathogens and repair that tissue. This can happen through um, a vascular reaction or a cellular reaction. With the vascular reaction, you see vasoconstriction followed by vasodilation which just allows for that increase of that fluid and blood and that nutrients to that area. With on the cellular level, um, you're, it's all the white blood cells. So you have an increase in white blood cells to that area to try to use as a defense mechanism against infection and injury. So your book describes in table 37.1 on page 1335, all the different types of white blood cells and their functions um, it is a great uh, chart there that I would just uh, be familiar with. So then we're going to talk about some fever. So infection or inflammation caused by either a bacteria or a virus or some other uh, source pathogen will stimulate endogenous pyrogens. And then those pyrogens act on the hypothalamus, which then triggers the prostaglandin production which increases your body temperature. Um, as this is happening, then this triggers a cold response where you may see shivering, some vasoconstriction, and a decrease in peripheral perfusion. Um, and all of those things um, will help decrease heat loss. So what results? You have fever. Typically for fever, we can give antipyretics um, that will help just lower the fever and increase any comfort. The other thing I just want to say about fever is um, it is important to distinguish between fever and hyperthermia. 
hyperthermia occurs because you have an unregulated rise in your core temperature. So you hear about those unfortunate incidences of kids left in hot automobiles. Um, that is um, a hyper hyperthermic event. Um, so normal neurologically uh, intact children, um, the body doesn't reach the level um, of fever or temperature as a hyperthermic child would. So what is the chain of infection? Um, we have an infectious agent. So this is the agent that's capable of causing infection. So you're talking your bacterias, your viruses, uh, maybe some fungi. Um, and then how do we try to ward off that infectious agent? Good hand washing, wearing gloves, um, and then making sure that we're cleaning, disinfecting, and using sterile techniques. Then the next chain of the infection is the reservoir. So that's the place where the pathogen can thrive and reproduce. So human body, animals, insects, water, um, inanimate objects. So thinking about like your stethoscope could be a reservoir for that um, infectious agent. Portal of exit is a way for that pathogen to exit the reservoir. So skin, mucous membranes, respiratory tract, urinary tract, uh, GI tract, so just being aware of when you're talking, when you're coughing, um, if you're sneezing, if you have open wounds, that you're very, very conscientious of those fields, um, making sure you're covering your mouth, your nose, if you're sneezing or coughing. Mode of transmission would be, is it a direct, sorry, direct transmission? Is it body to body contact or is it indirect where it's transferred from a vector um, either by droplet or by airborne transmission. Portal of entry would be the way the pathogen enters the host. And the susceptible host is any person that cannot resist that pathogen. So again, hand hygiene um, is your biggest um, and most important prevention of the spread of infection. So then we're going to talk a little bit about how we prevent the spread of infection. Um, we can definitely use some um, isolation precautions or standard precautions. So those standard precautions are your tier one. This applies to everyone, all children, all patients, anybody that you come in contact with. Um, tier two would be that transmission based on a specific precaution, which might be airborne, droplet, or contact. Again, your book on page 1338, box 37.3, does a really great job of kind of describing each of those different isolations and um, what you should be doing with each of those isolations. So what are some common treatments and medications? Common treatments for um, infectious disease processes and or communicable diseases can include hydration, and fever reduction. So we really want to promote proper fluid balance, whether that be orally or um, IV fluids. And then we want to reduce that fever. We can give antipyretics as a pharmacological agent, or we can use some non-pharmacological interventions. Um, the biggest thing that I just want to remind everybody is with kids, we have to avoid aspirin. Um, with, that's really any ch child or adolescent um, because of the risk of RISE syndrome. As far as medications, um, we have antibiotics, antivirals, antipyretics, and antipruretics. And the book, again, on page 1340 has a drug guide, 37.1, that gives the actions, indications, and what those nursing implications are for each of those medication groups. So nursing process, um, we're going to start with assessment. Um, so there's just kind of an overview of that child again with this infectious or communicable disorder. So for assessment, uh, we're going to start with health history. So it's really important to get that past medical history. This might include the pregnancy of the mom, um, what is the family history, and what is the history of um, what's going on now. Past excuse me, past medical history might be significant um, because maybe they have a lack of immunizations, 
maybe they were born prematurely. Did the maternal, um, did the, the mom have any infections during pregnancy? We would definitely want to know about those to see um, how we might proceed with our um, diagnosis and interventions. Family history might include, um, again, lack of immunizations. Has anybody had a recent infection or communicable disease? And then when we're looking at the present illness history, um, have they been exposed to any infectious or communicable diseases? Um, again, is there any history of immunizations? Have they had fever, sore throat, cough? Are they more tired and more lethargic? Um, are they poor feeding or have a decrease in appetite? Do they have any vomiting, any diarrhea um, and rash? Many children with infections and communicable diseases do, uh, rash is involved with this process and they can be very difficult to identify. So getting that really good um, assessment um, history and description um, will be helpful in trying to determine where that rash might be coming from. Nursing process assessment as far as physical exam, we're going to inspect, we're going to observe, and we're going to palpate. So during the inspection and observation part of this physical exam, we want to look at the child's skin, the mouth, the throat, and the hair for any lesions or wounds. Um, we're going to note any color, any shape, What's the distribution of any of the lesions or wounds? Um, is there any exudate or drainage from any of those lesions or wounds? And then we want to observe, are they scratching? Do they seem restless? Um, are they trying to avoid the use of that body part? Are they guarding? Um, and then also looking at their affect. Do they look more lethargic or do they have less energy? Um, and then we might be more concerned about um, sepsis or maybe a more serious infection at this point. We also want to assess hydration status and vital signs. Are their oral mucosas dry? Are they pale? Um, do they have sunken eyes? Do they not have any tears when they're crying? Those could be big signs of dehydration. And then assessment of vital signs. Um, if they have a temperature, you may also indicate uh, or you may also see tachypnea or tachycardia that might um, accompany that fever. Then we'll move on to palpation. We want to palpate that skin. We want to feel the temperature. What is the texture? How is their turgor? Does their skin have any moisture to it? Um, and then palpate that rash. Is it bumpy? Is it fine? Can you feel it at all? Um, and then palpate any lymph nodes. Are they swollen? Do they feel tender? Um, so just getting that good physical assessment um, exam completed. And then we're gonna hook lab and diagnostics into this assessment because um, some of these tests can really assist with the diagnosis of the disorder so that it can be used as a guideline in determining what the ongoing treatment may be. So some common tests that you might see will be um, a CBC, an ESR, CRP. They may draw blood cultures, um, take stool cultures, urine cultures, wound cultures, and throat cultures. So let's remember um, when we are drawing some blood specimen collection, we wanna use that A traumatic care. So performing that procedure somewhere other than the patient's room, we really want that child's bed to be kind of kept as a safe place for them, um, somewhere where they feel safe. Make sure you're providing teaching. Um, what are we drawing these labs for? Um, what does the procedure gonna look like? Um, think about using a topical anesthetics. You might use a cream or a gel, maybe a refrigerated spray um, to help with numbing that skin part um, where you're gonna take those labs. And then definitely get child life specialists involved. They're great with distraction. Um, they are good with comfort holding. Um, so child life specialists would be a great um, interprofessional team that you would wanna bring in during this time. So continuing on with the nursing process, we'll move on into diagnosis. Um, after your thorough assessment, then we are ready to do a nursing diagnosis that could be made for this patient. Um, it could be a risk for imbalanced body temperature, depending on if they have fever or not. Maybe they have some pains or some impaired comfort. 
um, checking that skin integrity. If they have a whopping rash, you might have an impaired skin integrity. They may have a risk for infection, deficient fluid volume, social isolation, and then knowledge um, deficit, and that would be very specific depending on the nursing diagnosis or what's going on with the patient. So interventions, um, goals, interventions, and evaluations are based on the nursing diagnosis. So whatever your assessment findings were will lead to your diagnosis, and then eventually we'll get to your interventions. Um, we want to talk specifically about comfort. If they have an impaired comfort or they're having pain, then some of the interventions you might think about are assessing pain in response to um, interventions frequently, administering analgesics or antipruretics as prescribed, applying cool compresses or baths to areas of pruritus, providing frequent fluids, may making sure they're staying hydrated. Um, that's also going to help with that fever if they're having any of that. Providing coolness, humidification, maybe dressing your patient in light colored clothing, and then using diversional or distraction activities. So when we want to talk about managing fever, fever in children is one of the most common reasons that parents are going to seek medical attention. We assess that temperature at least every four to six hours. If we give some kind of antipyretic, we're also going to assess that at least every 30 to 60 minutes after. And if there's any change in your, the condition of your patient, we definitely wanna be assessing that temperature. Measure the temperature in the same manner every time. So if you take it axillary, take it axillary every time. If it's under the tongue, then that's the way you wanna do it every time. That just keeps all those readings accurate. Administer antipyretics per your physician's order. Um, especially if the child's experiencing any discomfort or if the metabolic needs of that child just can't keep up um, because of the fever they're experiencing. Um, you will want to notify the physician um, of that fever or change in um, comfort level. Assess patient's intake, encourage oral intake, or make sure they have some kind of fluids going through their IV. And then keep the linens clean and dry as well as clothing. So if we're gonna move into managing um, skin rashes, um, skin rashes accompany, again, like I said, um, they will accompany most infectious or communicable diseases. They're typically very uncomfortable um, and irritating. So we want to um, Monitor those skin for color changes, temperature, redness, swelling, pain, signs of infection. Make sure you're monitoring any changes to rash lesions, distribution or size, um, really encouraging fluid intake and proper nutrition. And it's also pretty important to instruct those parents on the importance of maintaining that skin integrity, keeping their child's fingernails short, encouraging the patient to press on the area that's really itchy instead of scratching it. Um, and then making sure they're having good hand washing, using antipruretics and topical ointments or creams um, as prescribed by the physician. So sepsis um, is a pretty much a systemic over response to an infection that results um, from bacteria or viruses. Um, it can lead to septic shock, and it can be a medical emergency um, with children. Um, typically, children can be admitted um, and sometimes even to the intensive care unit. The common cause of these organisms that can cause sepsis might be E. coli, group B strep, staph aureus. Um, if you have a febrile neonate, they're typically going to get an incomplete full workup for sepsis. When after the infant is admitted, we um, just really close monitor them. We start some antibiotic therapy. Um, you'll see as far as the sepsis workup, you're going to see lots of labs drawn. You're going to see lots of cultures taken. But the biggest thing is you want to get that antibiotic on board and started pretty quickly after those labs have been captured. Um, once those cultures come back, if the final culture is reporting anything negative, then you could um, stop the antibiotics. Typically, they take about 
three to four days to get those cultures back. So you've got about 72 hours of treatment in them and you can stop those if they come back negative. Um, so again, as far as nursing assessment, getting that good health history, what is their present signs of illness, um, what is their past medical history, um, and what labs diagnosis are we thinking about getting. Um, nurse managing, we're gonna monitor that infant closely for any changes in condition, and we're gonna start those antibiotics. And then just as nurses, to prevent any further infection, um, because this is a potentially life-threatening illness, hand washing is very, very important with this patient population. Bacterial infections, so these are one-celled organisms that live, grow, and reproduce. Um, children, again, are at very high risk. Um, fortunately, many of these bacterial diseases, such as diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, are all preventable because of immunizations. Um, children, or sorry, so the ones that we're going to talk about are scarlet fever, diphtheria, pertussis, and tetanus. So methylene resistant staph aureus, um, or the community acquired um, MRSA, um, is resistant to certain antibiotics. You may hear nursing or um, provider staff call this the super bug because it really is resistant to lots of antibiotics and it can be very difficult um, to manage. Um, infections can range from minor skin rushes to abscesses to serious, that are serious and complicated. Transmission is person to person. It can be respiratory droplets. It can be by blood and it can be by sharing of personal items. Um, typically, if we're going to diagnose this, we're going to diagnose it with a culture. So we're going to IND an abscess, we're going to culture the skin, um, any fluid, any tissues that we can grab onto to get to the culture. As far as nurse, nurse management, we are going to start antibiotics. We're going to talk about com comprehensive wound care and then follow up and reassessment is vital for this family. So making sure you're educating the family on the importance of making sure they're taking all of those antibiotics, that they're using proper hand hygiene, and that they're really discouraging from sharing personal items that might be towels, combs, hair clips, anything like that. All right, scarlet fever is an infection resulting from group A strep. So you'll see this with kiddos that get diagnosed with strep throat that are not caught fast enough. Um, transmission is usually by droplets and follows contact with respiratory tract secretions. Um, as far as nursing assessment, um, you'll see fever, you'll see body aches, you'll see a loss of appetite, maybe some nausea and vomiting. The tonsils may have a yellow or white specks on it. Um, and you'll see what they call a strawberry tongue. So that tongue looks beefy, but looks red, and it almost has those little dots like strawberries do. Um, you may also see some cervical lymph nodes that might be swollen. Um, diagnosis is made by a throat culture. Nursing management includes antibiotics. That choice of antibiotics is penicillin V. Um, and then just make sure again that you're educating that family on the importance of taking all of those antibiotics. A lot of times kids will feel a lot be better after two or three days on that medicine, but really make sure they're taking the full 10 day course. And then really make sure they're also, the parents are encouraging fluid intake and maintaining that hydration. Diphtheria um, is a, um, may affect the nose, the larynx, tonsils, the oral pharynx. Tonsillar and pharyngeal infections are the most common. So you see the pseudomembrane that forms over the pharynx, uvula, tonsils, or soft palate. And you can see that in that picture, kind of that yellowish, whitish coating that's back there. The neck um, becomes edematous um, and lymphadenopathy can develop, which the problem with this is then it causes airway obstruction and maybe some suffocation. So again, routine infant immunizations can prevent this disease. Therapeutic management just involves antibiotics and antitoxins, and then making sure you're really managing that airway.
Pertussis is an acute respiratory disorder characterized by the proximal cough or that whooping cough um, and copious secretions. Um, the incubation period for this disease is 6 to 21 days. So you'll hear families say they've had cold symptoms for 7 to 10 days, and then all of a sudden they have this really strange sounding cough that's happening, and that's typically what brings them in. Um, again, this is an immunization that can prevent this. Infants and young children continue to be required to take the four doses of that DTaP, and then a fifth one is given between four and six years of age. And then it has been found since pertussis has been a little bit more in the community setting that children older than 11 should actually have another booster with their T, T their tetanus diphtheria. So you'll see them get a Tdap. Um, as far as therapeutic management, um, we're providing respiratory support. We're recommending antimicrobial treatment. Treat Treatment choice for pertussis is azithromycin. It's a five-day course. Um, and again, making sure that the parents are taking the full five days. Tetanus is a fatal neurological disease. Um, it's characterized by um, increased muscle tone, spasms, the C tetani spores can really live anywhere, um, but the four most common places that it will live is in the soil, in the dust, in the feces of humans and animals, um, including sheep, cattle, chickens, dogs, cats. Um, and when they enter the body, either through a wound or some contaminated source, then they multiply quickly and produce this um, poisonous toxin that's released. So what can we do for these patients? We can make sure we're supporting respiratory and cardiovascular function, that we're stopping that toxin production, we're neutralizing the unbound toxins, and we're controlling muscle spasms. So typically you might see a patient complain of headache, some of these spasms, a little bit of crankiness or cramping of the jaw. Um, so you'll hear lock jaw a lot um, when you talk about tetanus. Um, once those initial signs hit, then it's followed by difficulty swallowing. They may have a stiff neck. Um, so we really want to observe for those signs of any respiratory distress, put them in a quiet environment to try to control some of those spasms, um, and then make sure we're managing appropriately any pain, nutrition, hydration um, status. And then again, tetanus is preventable. There's a vaccine out there. So really just educating family about the vaccines. So we'll move into viral infections. Viral infections include viral exanthem. Exanthem meaning a rash or some kind of skin um, eruption. And then we'll talk about uh, uh, those include rubella, which is German measles, rubiola, which are just measles, and then varicella zoster, which is chicken pox. Um, and then the other viral infection we'll talk about is mumps. So viral exanthems, we talked about as rubella, rubiola, and varicella zoster. So the charts on page 1356 to 1359 in your book, table 37.4, um, do a great job talking about each of these disease processes. What are the clinical manifestations? How are they managed? What are some complications? And then what are those nursing implications for each of them? As far as rubella, um, rash is typically the first sign. It's the German measles. It's caused by the rubella virus. Um, it's usually mild and self-limiting, and treatment is usually just supportive. With rubiola or measles, um, that's caused by the measles virus. Um, again, treatment is supportive. It can include antipyretics some bed rest, and making sure they're taking an adequate fluids. With varicella or the chicken pox, this is the varicella zoster virus or human herpes virus number three. Again, it's self-limiting. Treatment is usually supportive, uh, making sure if they have fever that we're reducing that fever, we're giving antipyretics and helping with skin care to prevent any additional infection or lesions um, if the child is scratching. So 
um, educating on some comfort measures um, and the use of those antipyretics, um, kind of a big deal with these. Mumps um, is a contagious disease caused by the paramoxavirus. It's characterized by fever and parotitis. So parotitis is that inflammation and swelling of that parotid gland. And I've seen several cases of mumps and this picture pretty explains it pretty well. So it's one-sided and that whole side is very inflamed. Complications of mumps, mumps can include meningitis um, with or without encephalitis with seizures. Um, it, can, it can account for some of our pancreatitis patients. They can have some auditory neuritis, which can result in hearing loss. Um, therapeutic management is supportive. Um, mumps can be um, taken away again with your immunization. So educating those families again on getting those vaccines it is a two dose series um, given as childhood vaccines. So zoonotic and vector-borne infections. Um, these are infectious agents that are transmitted directly or indirectly from animals or vectors, such as ticks, mosquitoes, or other insects. So zoonotic that we're gonna talk about cat scratch fever and rabies. And then the vector-borne are Lyme disease, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. So cat scratch disease is self-limited, typically resolves on its own in two to four months. It's relatively common. Um, sorry, it's relatively common and occasionally serious disease caused by the bacteria that's carried in cat's saliva. So lymphadenopathy is your biggest indicator. Um, therapeutic management is supportive and aimed for management of just symptoms. Um, as far as nursing assessment, uh, they may say they have headaches, they may have fever, they may be, uh, feel anorexia or fatigue. Um, and then all, part of that history is have they had any interactions or rough play with cats or kittens that might result in some kind of um, scratch or bite? Um, and then you'll want to administer antibiotics. Standard precautions are sufficient. And then really educating that family or those children to avoid rough play with cats and kittens. Rabies is the next one we'll talk about, and it's a preventable vi viral infection of the central nervous system. Usually comes from the saliva of a rabid animal, um, usually by form of a bite. So making sure you're getting a good history of that animal bite. Um, early symptoms of rabies infections may be very nonspecific. They may say they feel like they have the flu, maybe fever, headache. Um, generalized fatigue, but as that virus spreads to the central nervous system, you may see encephalitis develop, um, progressive neurological manifestations, including insomnia, confusion, anxiety, hallucinations, um, eventually progressing to paralysis if it doesn't get managed. Nursing management includes intensive support care as required, um, recovery, unfortunately is extremely rare. So really making sure that um, they're seeking medical care if they have any animal bite. Lyme disease um, is a common reported vector-borne disease. Um, it's transmitted to the human via a bite of an infected black-legged tick. So the prognosis for this and for recovery for children um, is very excellent if they get treated. Um, in most cases, it's cured by antibiotics. The antibiotic choice is doxycycline. Um, typically, we don't like to give doxycycline to anyone younger than eight because it can cause permanent discoloration of teeth. Um, and usually eight-year-olds um, or older have their permanent teeth that, that we don't wanna discolor. So um, anybody younger, we should probably treat with um, amoxicillin. Clinical signs of Lyme disease are divided in three different stages. You have early localized, 
you have early disseminated and then late disease process. You're going to observe um, a rash. It's a ring-like rash at the side of the tick bite. You'll sometimes hear it referred to as a bull's eye rash. So we will administer antibiotics. There's really no transmission-based precautions, so we'll do standard precautions. And then really prompt removal of tick is essential in preventing Lyme disease. So how do we teach guidelines for tick removal? Um, you want to use that fine-tipped tweezer, protect fingers with the tissue, um, paper towel, or latex. Sorry guys, um, protect fingers with tissue, paper towel, or latex gloves. Make sure you're grasping that tick as close to the skin as possible and pull um, upward steadily with even pressure. Don't twist or jerk the tick when removing it. You really wanna make sure you get that head of the tick out from underneath the skin surface. Once the tick is removed, make sure you clean the site with soap and water um, and wash your hands. Save the tick for any identification in case the child does become ill. Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever um, is the most severe and frequent reported rick ricket illness. Um, it usually comes from a dog tick or a wood tick. Um, complications can include non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, cerebral edema, or multi-organ damage. Um, if you get some of this long-term neurological involvement, you may have partial paralysis, hearing loss, loss of bladder or bowel control, um, movement disorders, language disorders also may be seen. In most cases, um, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever resolves rapidly without appropriate, if, with appropriate antibiotic therapy. Tetracyclines, doxycyclines are your treatment of choice. You will see a skin rash which starts, which starts as small pink macular blanchable spots on the wrist, forearm, and ankles, um, but that when it will rapidly spread all over the entire body. Parasitic and helminthic infections um, include um, your scabies, your head lice. The helminth include penworms, roundworms, and hookworms. So these are um, these um, infections receive nourishment from the host without having any benefit of killing the host. So here are some pictures of parasitic and helminthic um, infections. Um, just try to remember, um, often parents are pretty embarrassed that their children have these diseases. So just be very reassuring that really these infections can happen with any children. So on slide one here, that's your scabies. Um, it's contact precaution, typically treated prophylactically, um, and you just wanna make sure you're avoiding direct skin to skin contact. The second picture is of head lice, um, and again, contact precaution. You will usually treat the hair, and then you really want to educate the family to comb out the nits, comb out any live lice that they might still see. Household and other close contacts need to be examined, um, dry clean, and um, on any non-washable linens or items, and then make sure you're just soaking all the combs and the hair brushes um, that might have been used during that time frame. The third slide is a picture of a hookworm. Um, treatment is typically with mebendazole or albendazole. Standard precautions are sufficient for these patients. Proper sanitation and disposal of all feces that these patients might have. So think about those uh, diapered patients that may have this. Uh, make sure you're disposing of those diapers in a proper placement. Treatment of all known infested people um, so making sure like mom or dad, whoever's been changing that diaper, don't need treatment also. And then just making sure that you're encouraging the wearing of shoes um, and not going outside barefoot. Slide four is penworms. Um, so these are best visualized in the middle of the night. So a lot of times we'll educate our parents to let the child go to sleep, go into their room, take a flashlight, don't turn on any lights, and then it's best viewed in that dark. You can take transparent tape and press it up against those worms to kind of grab all those eggs. Um, treatment of choice is mebendazole. 
And a lot of times we do encourage showering first thing in the morning because a lot of times they'll get rid of a lot of those, um, a large portion of the eggs that might have landed overnight. And the last slide here is on sexually transmitted infections. So this is sexual contact, either orally, vaginally, or by intercourse. Some of these infections can include gonorrhea, chlamydia, trichomonas, herpes, or even HIV. And it is estimated that one in four adolescent women in the United States do have one of these sexually transmitted infections. If you have any questions or concerns, we can talk about it in class on Tuesday. Thanks, guys.